All right, so uh, other day I, uh, I was telling a family member that I was going to do this talk. I was going to do a talk here. Uh, and she asked, what's your talk about? And uh, <laughs> I say, well, it's Bitcoin related. I don't want to explain it. Go to a search engine. And she's, she's 65 years old and she says, no, I saw it on TV. It's computer money, right? Exactly. Anyways, if you, uh, if you made that trip to the search engine, you might find something like, like this, like, hey, it's a big revolution, it's going to change society, it's going to change money, it's going to change everything, right? So uh, uh, I don't hop to any conclusions on that, but uh, there has been a revolution. It's, uh, there's been a revolution related to this. Uh, at a minimum, there's been a revolution in cryptography in the last 30 years, and uh, there's been a revolution in, uh, uh, maybe that revolution is probably also a technological revolution too. So uh, I'm going to try and leave this up as long as I can. If anyone wants to decode this, it's, uh, it's symmetric encryption. So the, uh, the same knowledge I required to encrypt it is the same knowledge you required to decrypt it. The key is 13. Rotate 13. Has so anyone got that one down or know what it says? Yeah, you're close. We got time. No, no. Almost there. All right, I'm going to move us on. It says, so where did my Bitcoins go? <laughs> I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. You got to shout it out. Okay, so that's symmetric encryption. The real revol we've had actually two revolutions in cryptography. Uh, we've gotten symmetric encryption that's a lot better than that, and we've got asymmetric encryption. So here's the uh, classic example of what you can do with asymmetric encryption. Um, the, uh, Bob wants to send Alice a message, so uh, Bob acquires, Al you have two keys, you have a private key and a public key. So in this case, yeah, Alice is public key, Alice is private key. So Bob gets a, a copy of Alice's public key. She, he's uh, able to encrypt his message. Al Al Alice gets the ciphertext. She's able to decrypt it with her private key. This is the other thing you can do with public key cryptography um, that's uh, more relevant to Bitcoin here. Um, so you're sending a message, and you can prove to anyone who's got your public key that it's you that sent the message, or at least it's whoever has the corresponding private key that sent the message. So the way the Bitcoin network works is that you're sending out, uh, you're sending out messages, and this is an idea people thought of 30 years ago when public key crypto came along. They said, hey, you can control your money with, by signing a message to say, hey, my funds go here now, my funds go here now. So Bitcoin takes advantage of that. Uh, and that means key management is really, really critical. Uh, you've got to, uh, um, your private key, you know, is not something you want to be regenerating in, again because your funds are attached to it. You lose it, you lose your funds, right? And so, you know, it, it may not be the case that everyone's going to want to get into key management. They might entrust that to other people. So, um, and here's a bit more about how it works in Bitcoin land. So, relationship between private key, public key is there, and one's derived from the other. Um, and when someone sends you, uh, if, you request, uh, if you request funds from someone, you're going to uh, give them not your public key, but you give them a hashed version of it. So in this case, um, I abbreviated it, one Satoshi, blah, 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 blah. So... Um, and then when you want to claim funds that have gone to that address, a hashed version of your public key, so you haven't actually published the public key up, up to that point, uh, which is going to provide some security against quantum computers. Uh, but when you're actually ready to claim it, then you sign a message saying, yeah, 
I got the public key, I got the private key, you guys know this address is derived from it, I'm moving it over here to Edward Snowden. <laughs> there actually is a vanity uh, at Bitcoin address for the uh, Edward Snowden support fund, so. I didn't put them out in full though here, I just, five characters moved on. Okay, so the part I'm gonna skip over about Bitcoin and hand we over, because it's not actually what my talk is about, it, and it's actually the thing that got everybody excited about it. It's a peer, it's a peer, -peer decentralized network that and you know it's got a ledger system where it's storing who's got what amount of value. Um, so how you how you get a peer-to-peer -peer network to actually agree on who's got what is, is a challenging problem. That's kind of held people up for years. The the private key, public key stuff people figured out right away. Hey, you could do money with that, and it's easy if you centralize it. It's hard if you decentralize it. Anyways, I'm not going to explain how that works. These are the buzzwords that you can punch into into a search engine if you want to learn more more about how Bitcoin does that stuff. Um, in, interestingly enough, Bitcoin solution isn't the only one. There's also something called proof of stake that you can do uh, to make uh, to distribute stuff. And uh, a system called Ripple has uh, an interesting consensus system they came up with where, uh, unlike in Bitcoin, where the nodes don't have to trust each other at all, in, in Ripple you can have like a certain minimal amount of trust that people won't collude with each other. So, but it's really, it's a good design. You should look into it. But, but on to this. Okay, so offline, right? Uh, if your money's valuable enough, you're not going to keep your private key on on a computer you're hooking up to the internet. If you're uh, if you're and this is what big players are doing, they're uh, they're keeping it offline. And so one of the modes of doing this is you sign your message saying, "Okay, funds are moving over here." You carry it through SneakerNet, maybe on a flash drive, and then and then you put it out out to Bitcoin land, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, another sort of way to think in offline is that uh, you generate your private key and uh, you don't even have to store it on a computer. You could store your private key on a piece of paper uh, and put that in your safety deposit box. And then it's sort of when you want to redeem that and bring it, move, move the funds again, then you move it to a computer that's online and tell Bitcoin land, okay, funds are moving. Uh, and then another version of this is uh, you, you memorize something that your private key can be derived from. And, it, um, and of course, uh, you know, rubber hose cryptography comes into play if you're doing that. So, uh, and it also comes back to key management too. You're like, if it's, uh, if it's strong enough to not be crackable or guessable to others, then you have a good chance of forgetting it. So uh, not the best option, but that is another, the most offline thing you can have. Like it's not even in your safe anywhere else. Okay, so offline solves all your problems, right? You don't have, uh, the internet is dangerous and if you're not on the, if your private key isn't on the internet, everything's gonna be okay, right? Well, of course not. So here's some things that can go wrong uh, in an offline system. And these could go wrong for two reasons. They could go wrong by way of um, a bug in the software you're using to, to, generate, to generate keys offline or what if the software you're obtaining, even if it's from one of the major, one of major Bitcoin wallet softwares, what if, it's, uh, what if there's been a compromise upstream, right? So HTTPS isn't gonna help you there. You know, okay, great, you have a secure path to getting the wrong thing. Then PGP signing it isn't gonna help you if, if they've screwed up, if they're, if they're just signing something they've built and, uh, you know, how closely are they checking what they're building, right? So those are the two reasons things could go off long, be it a bug or be it malice on the side you get stuff from. Okay, so there could be a misuse of your uh, cryptographically secure random number generator, because uh, you, you want to generate your private keys from a random source. So if that's, uh, if that's not up to crypto grade, uh, then yeah, you could have a bad time. Um, one possible disaster would be um, so your, your public key is derived from your, public, your private key and then your Bitcoin address is derived from your public key, so there's a chain there to screw up. And so if you tell people send funds to this public Bitcoin address, you know, and they say it looks like a good address, it passes the checksums, you may never actually be able to claim it if your private key doesn't actually correspond to the public key that corresponds to that address. So uh, if you generate that wrong, you'll be in trouble. Um, and sometimes people uh, aren't storing the private key itself, but some kind of seed, such as a, pa such as a 
good passphrase, hopefully, or uh, or maybe uh, you know they'll store um, 128 bits and hash that to get the 256 bits that the key is. So uh, if there's not if that correspondence isn't isn't correct, you could uh, you could be in trouble. Um, and of course, if you're doing seeds uh, instead of storing the whole the whole private key, then uh, you want to uh, you want to make sure that that uh, uh, isn't too small. Uh, and so, yeah, if it's small enough to memorize, you uh, you might be in trouble. Um, or if the process that you do that conversion from seed to key, you could have a flaw there where you're actually converging on a smaller space than you think you are. You know, you're taking, taking 90 bits and turning it into a 40-bit space. And then um, you don't want to do this uh, when you're signing stuff. Uh, uh, Sony got in a level. The, uh, the public key signing system in Bitcoin is ECDSA. And uh, Sony got in a lot of trouble with that because there's, uh, I don't know the crypto details exactly, but you're supposed to generate, when you do your signatures, you're supposed to generate some random data and not reuse it for your next signature or else uh, you're giving away too much info. So uh, Sony did that and uh, with consequences. Um, Right, you don't want your wallet software logging stuff intentionally, unintentionally, in uh, places where you don't think it is. If you're trying to clean it up, because um, then someone else might be able to find find your private key that way uh, when they when they catch up with it later. Uh, so you know they, uh, you know, someone knocks on your door and you're, you're sure your machine was never ever connected to the internet, but it's got writable firmware, it's got a writable hard drive, so it could be there. Um, and all that kind of comes to what I'm going to talk about later is like. You've, uh, okay, even if you trust the software you're using to generate private key and public key pairs offline, you want to do that on a, tr on a platform of hardware and operating system software that you trust. So if you don't, if you can't trust your platform, then you can get lied to. You can, you could even audit the code in the way I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, and the platform could lie to you. It could show you what you're expecting the code to look like, and that you know even when you do checksums and all that stuff, but you might actually be running something else. So, uh, platform trust is something you may want to start thinking about when you're uh, storing, when you're generating, uh, dealing with large amounts of uh, a Bitcoin value offline. Oh yeah, so can uh, it could thwart your audit or could log your key. So the um, yeah, I think anyone who's uh, who's really big in this space should should actually be thinking about uh, not just downloading binaries from the leading wallet services uh, and running them, but actually reading the code and compiling it. And then, and of course, you got to make sure you trust your compiler and the, the system you build it on. Um, so, uh, and you really have to audit everything in a program. So most of these programs are graphical, okay? And so you can't just audit the key cryptographic parts. Because, um, as we say, uh, as we say in the world of dynamic languages, there's a concept of of uh, monkey patching, right? So if there's a uh, if there's an, something malicious in the code that's drawing uh, your pretty windows, uh, it could be it could be patching the part of your program that uh, that does the critical stuff. So you really have to, if you're going to be auditing. Your software, like reading all the code before running it, and compiling it, and running it, you uh, you really have to read everything because of monkey patching, um, which of course you know can be done. There's the equivalent in the compiled world too. It's not just in. It's nice and easy in dynamic languages like Python, but it's uh, it's doable in anything. And that's just a reference to the last slide for anyone who catches it in passing. Okay, so when you're doing an audit of the code. The, uh, the amount of code you have to look at to do that uh, makes a big difference. So on the left here, we've got the four largest uh, wallet software programs in uh, the, like the four most established wallet software programs in Bitcoin land. They're, they all have graphical user interfaces. Um, I figured uh, putting this graph in um, lines of code uh, would go over people's head. So I was using a, a lines of code counting program and uh, it outputs in dollar value. So I'm going to use that as my metric for code complexity and how much time it takes to audit it. Okay, so $3 million for Armory, 800000 for Electrum at the smallest. Uh, that's me there, offline audible at $27,000, uh, which it seems like a high number to me. I don't feel like I put that much work into it so far. Uh, but 
the um, uh, similar, kind of in a similar spirit to what I'm doing is uh, Pi Wallet and NoBrainer. They're both like command line only, no GUI, so that there's way less code there to uh, to look at. Um, and I, yeah, I, I thought mine, what I was working on was small until I discovered uh, NoBrainer. It's uh, it's not it's not as featureful, but it um, it outputs uh, an encoding of 90 bits like that, and that's all it does. It says, "Here's your Bitcoin address. Here's your 90 bits that you need to write down uh, from a word dictionary, and that's it." And it does that in about 30 lines. Okay, so I've been I've been beaten by NoBrainer, uh, and then I've also highlighted on the right um, the ECDSA library that we're all using. If I came here today and and told you folks that I wrote my own ECDSA implementation from scratch, you would uh, I would I would hope somebody would uh, you know, pull a weapon or something, because like that's a no-no. Um, Electrum, PyWallet, my code, no-brainer. They, they all use this Python ECDSA library. So, um, yeah, lots of people are are presumably already looking at it and seeing uh, it does some of the most critical stuff uh, related to what I said earlier. So, uh, yeah, either either we're all we're all in this together. Either we're all screwed, or uh, or we're all uh, probably fine. Um, anyways, this graph is a bit unreadable too for comparison. So here's it in uh, logarithmic scale, just uh, just to get a better sense. I'm gonna move on from that. Okay, so my motivation uh, for thinking in terms of I want to do Bit I want to generate Bitcoin addresses offline, and I want the code that does that to be auditable. Is um, one thing that's come up is we've got two members at Skullspace, our local hacker space, who are uh, who are having a baby, and. I, I said, "Hey, um, you know, this Bitcoin thing could maybe uh, maybe wor worth a lot in 18 years, or maybe it won't be worth anything, and it'll make a good story. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put forward about twenty dollars worth uh, once this uh, new Skull Space baby comes into the world, and uh, and so I want to tell those folks, hey, I want you to hold it offline, generate it offline, and hold it 18 years. Don't touch it. You gotta hold it for you know life assets. Uh, when the kid's old enough." Uh, and so it occurred to me that like if you're going to be sitting that long, sitting on it that long, you know, and, and you want to avoid the temptation of moving it around and possibly putting it on a computer where, where uh, bad stuff can happen, then um, that, that's where auditability adds something because you can go back and look at how it was generated and say, I have nothing to worry about, it's going to be okay. Um, you know. Though we'll see what we'll see what happens to the crypto over this uh, this time period. You know, a lot of people think the quantum computers are going to, uh, any, you know, maybe they'll be uh, they'll be scaled up enough to break ECDSA by then, but uh, but they got to break the two two hashing algorithms as well because you just put a Bitcoin address out on the network. It's a hashed version using two different hashing algorithms of your public key. So until you're redeeming and uh, uh, moving funds out of that address for the first time, no one. Uh, uh, you know, you got three crypto problems to solve with your, uh, with whatever the computers of the future are. So, uh, 18 years isn't out, isn't out of the question. Maybe for uh, for just holding and, uh, you know, looking back at the code and saying it was fine, it was fine. Just hold, just hold. Okay, so we're gonna demo uh, some of what I put together. All right, so I've got. Um, it's no GUI, but I've got a command line version of this, and I've got a printed menu version of this. And by pr I say printed method menu because I'm not using uh, fancy, um, or for the most part, except for one exception later, I'm not using uh, fancy libraries for doing graphics in a terminal. Um, so you could actually use the the menu version and the command line version on a teletype if you if you're going that offline, you know. So. Simple cases, key, key generation. So this is an encoding of a private key. This is a coding of a Bitcoin address that corresponds to that private key. And so, and this is in uh, what's called the wallet import format. It's supported by all the wallets. So, if you wrote this down, kept it in a safety deposit box, maybe laminated, uh, or in your uh, mattress, the uh, you can count the, on this being well enough known that it's going to be. Uh, supported a long time out. If you didn't write this down as well, uh, no big deal. You can, I mean, you want to do this anyways as one more test, right? You can see that uh, when you, you can restore it years later and uh, get the same, uh, same address out. Okay, so 
Here's a more pretty version. I'm going to do this with the uh, command line version so I can get into that, or the menued version. Okay, do you want to generate a key, restore a key, or quit? I'm generating a key. Uh, do you want to just directly generate a private key, or do you want to derive one from a seed or a passphrase? The last two I haven't even implemented yet, so just straight to key. Ah, do you trust your crypto grade random number generator from your offering system, which in some cases are, is depending on random number generators from your, to some extent from your, uh, from your processor maker, right? So um, if you don't trust those, you can supplement it a bit with uh, some dice rolls. And the keyword there is supplement. You don't want to give the user the option to just provide you randomness from their own source because they're probably not going to provide you enough bits and you don't want to fill it out with zeros, right? So um, the, uh, yeah, so here we'll add some dice rolls. Okay, we got one bite out of that. And the rest still came from the uh, RNG and then I, we hashed it so there's no uh, common prefixes. Okay, I'll put format. So this time around I'll use the dictionary words. So there we go. Uh, so you wouldn't expect to memorize these uh, unless you've built a memory palace in your mind that's sort of a technique for, for um, memorization. But uh, one advantage for me writing these down is um, there's a few advantages. One would be um, because you're writing an entire word uh, and not uh, a letter at a time. Like, it doesn't matter if you screw up a letter a bit. Like, if you're uh, if you're not sure if this is N E E I L or uh, I can't even think of a variation. It was a good not a good example. All right. So yeah, this and the um, the dictionary I'm using to provide this word list is in RFC. 1760, which was a one-time password scheme. So really nifty thing about that dictionary is even if you, even if this code is gone uh, at some point, you know, I'm dead, get help stunt, dead, etc. you know, somebody's going to have that RFC mirrored out there, right? Uh, whereas, who knows, maybe people will even forget the, the base 58 encoding I was showing you. So this, uh, um, really, if you, if you knew that RFC, RFC 1760 was used for this, and you found that years later, you could, even without the source code, you could reconstruct the fact that this, these 24 words are encoding 32 bytes or 256 bits, uh, and you could go from there. Uh, so we'll try, copy paste this, and then there's the corresponding Bitcoin address, and then we'll do a redemption, quit. Restoration. All right, 1M, blah, 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 ends in KV. 1M, blah, blah, ends in KV, okay. And then you've got the uh, wallet import format. So there's a restore. Um, we'll come back to the demo mode. So um, this is the thing that I'm uh, a little more excited about. The, um, I've put together a two of three scheme for storing um, the 32 by bytes or 256 bits of, uh, of key data. And so uh, and there's two situations that have come up where I think that's going to be useful. Um, I mentioned, okay, you could, you could write your private key down on paper and put it in your safety deposit box, right? But what if you don't, what if you don't trust entirely that banks' employees aren't going to look in there and just copy it down, right? Unlike having a gold bar, you, you're not even going to notice that it's gone until, you know, until they use it and then it might be down the road. So um, the uh, exclusive OR provides a really interesting way you can have, uh, you can split things up with redundancy. Um, this is what's used in uh, RAID 5 uh, for uh, disk storage. So where you can have uh, the space data, the amount of disk space used being uh, like say two disks, but you got it across three disks so you can afford to lose one. Um, that's a bit of a joke. Okay, so this is where this comes in, uh, the algebra of exclusive OR. So A is OR, B is C. What if you've lo lost, uh, if you've lost B, well you can recover B from A is OR, C. And if you've lost A, you can recover it from B is OR, C. Uh, and so I'll just show a bit how I use this. Okay, so say your 32-bit key, or 32 bytes, 256 bits key is A. You could uh, generate another random uh, 32 bytes, call it B. 
and you could Zor them, see? And you could chunk each of them up like this. And then you could stripe them. So you say, well, okay, we're going to organize them into these three colors and then arrange them this way. I've got three names in here because uh, sort of one of the applications for this is uh, if uh, at Skullspace we're going to hold a little bit of Bitcoin long term. And so we've got, we're going to have uh, three trustees who are each going to have um, one, uh, one third of the key data and a little bit extra data so that any two of them could come together and, and recreate the private key and move the funds. So that's not only redundancy on, uh, on someone losing it, but also just uh, someone disappearing or uh, someone not being in agreement, one of the three not being in agreement, right? It only takes two out of three to agree to it. So you can see here, uh, Ian's got the first third, A sub zero, of actual key data and no more. The rest is, is random. I've got uh, A sub one and Stefan's got A sub two. So, okay, so if Stefan gets hit by a bus, you can recombine these and, and find his part. And uh, if I get hit by a bus, then Stefan and Ian can come together and, and so on. Okay. So I'll just demo this. Uh, slightly smaller terminal window. I've still got some curses related bugs here. Uh, and I'll show you why, I'm, this, this is the exception. This is where I am using curses. Uh, and you'll see why in a moment. Oops, wrong here. Okay, we're going to generate a private key. How do we want to generate it? Just direct to a key from a random, just random source. Okay, we're doing two or three Zor scheme. Um, and so then, yeah, you can also provide your own entropy on the, you know, what I had as B there, the second random stream. That so here we'll just do this. All right, now we're using curses, and you're about to see why it's handy. So when I bring Ian and Stefan together to do this, I want to make sure that, um, assuming we all trust the platform we're running on, and that's a big if, uh, we, uh, we can at least have a process where we get it all started up together, we get it this far, one of us can grab our part, write it down, verify that we've got it right, and then you know, clear the screen so the next guy can do it. So, okay, are we ready for the first component? Yes, we are. Write it down. Write it down. And I mentioned in the text here, another alternative to writing it down, it, if, you're, uh, if you're using a password manager on a computer because you've got lots of things you need to not forget, you know, and you have, you've made the effort to memorize a really strong encryption passphrase from that, well then maybe that's another place you would, be, um, you would be storing something like this. But you're probably doing that on an online computer, so things can still go wrong, but it's an option. At least you can back it up that way too. You can ha you know, it's in your head, the decryption key is in your head, and the actual chunk of data that you need to decrypt is in a bunch of places. Okay, so, okay, we're gonna, so now's the test, did I, did I remember it? Yes, I did. You got it. So now I say next, and then I say, okay, now it's, now it's Ian's turn. You come and get a, a chunk of the key here. So same thing, blah, blah, blah. Oops. All right, test time. Yeah, you got it. Component three. Got it. Okay, and then we're done. If you look at then in the uh, in the scroll buffer, uh, you know, not there wasn't a way for one of us to look back at what uh, what else was going on. Though, yeah, we do have to trust that one of us didn't, you know, set the platform up with key logging or memory logging or whatever. So uh, that doesn't go away. But okay, here's our Bitcoin address that those three chunks of data corresponded to, and we'll just attempt to restore. Okay, so who should we kill off? Number one, number two, number three. Okay, I, I forget who was who. Ian was number one, we'll say. So, restore, key, restore. Number one is blank. Number two, oh yeah, I gotta quote this. Number three. Ah, good catch. Thank you very much. 
And I forgot the flag, that's all. Soar RFC seventeen sixty. Okay. One MPJ, blah 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 blah, ends in VS, one MPJ, ends in VS. Okay, so there we were able to uh, we were able to recover. Okay, so we got lots of bonus time, so I've got uh, I've got bonus material. Um, I mentioned that um, even when you're offline, the platform you're running this all on uh, that either compiles that compiles your code, that lets you inspect your code with a text editor, that lets you inspect it with with uh, with checksumming tools, uh, you're depending on that not lying to you, um, and so um, this could matter if you were using uh, had keys that had a lot of money tied to them, uh, or maybe if you get into sort of a uh, you know computer science dystopia. So we'll uh, we'll just imagine a world where every new platform that comes out is untrustworthy uh, and is uh, and is betraying you in some way. Um, but they haven't been bothered, whoever they is, to get rid of all our old equipment. It's still sitting in our closets, uh, and you can go and get it on the black market. But the uh, you know in the, the dystopian world is putting out putting out software that promises to not betray you to run on your platform. They're putting it out there on the dark net, and they're putting it guys with it out there in the in the dark alley. And so, okay, you might have some machine old, really, really, really old machines like this in your closet: original Mac, an Amiga 1000, an IBM PC. Uh, as it turns out, uh, as soon as Consumer-friendly machines like this came around. We actually got into a little bit of trouble for this scenario. Okay, all of these machines have firmwares, and the Amiga and the Mac had pretty, uh, pretty fancy, fancy uh, firmwares. This is an Amiga firmware, but those firmwares uh, no longer had features built in for you to program the machine. Just relying on the hardware and the firmware, you had to have external media hard drives, floppy drives, cassette drives to make them do anything. They were no longer un unlike previous. Uh, microcomputers, they were not self-programmable. So all those ones I just showed are actually kind of useless because, yeah, you go to the guy in the black market and he says, yeah, I've got, a, I've got an Ubuntu 1204 CD for you, but how do you know? How do you know it wasn't burnt recently and is compromised in some way and it's not, you know, and you can't use it as a, you can't rely on it as a, as a media, as, a, as part of your platform before running whatever you're running. So we've got a bootstrapping problem here big time bootstrapping problem. Uh, and it turns out there's a way around it. So you gotta go re a little more ancient. This is a VIC-20. Uh, we've got one at, uh, we have one on Skullspace's virtual list of items that we don't store on site but that people are holding at home and can borrow. Uh, and it's got, uh, so it's got a built-in, its firmware has, uh, has a basic interpreter. And it's got general purpose IO pins. Uh, and so, um, one of the, th what I imagine you doing is, you know, you're not going to want to do all your, your, your Bitcoin stuff or your mo modern stuff on an old platform like this. Um, I imagine you can use an old platform like this to maybe bootstrap a slightly newer platform. Uh, and so here's what you would do. You would, you would take a computer you don't trust, and you would write the code you wanted to run on that computer, and you wanted to run with some trust. And you'd have to uh, compile it to assembly and compare, OK, is, does this assembly output match the, uh, what I wrote? Now, of course, you may be, your platform may be lying to you. It may be giving you the assembly that corresponds to this code when you view it in an editor, right? But the underlying file may not be like this at all. And then you can do a matching of your assembly to your, uh, your machine code. And again, you could be lied to there. So, um, and you'd want your program to be small enough to be able to do that. You know, this is gonna be time intensive even with a small program. So you're probably looking at like custom operating systems that you're trying to bootstrap to get yourself out of this trouble, right? So here, here's how you get around that. If you trust the, if you trust the VIC-20 hardware and you trust the fir firmware, then the high level here is that you could, um, if you had some flash memory that could be moved around and programmed with I2C, 
uh, which is like a two-wire serial bus. Uh, and you could do that on the, on the general purpose I.O. pins. Uh, another feature of I2C is that it's like master-slave and you control the clocking. So this really ridiculous old computer, you could actually do it. There's actually a video on YouTube of one guy doing I2C with buttons by hand. <laughs> so that, because it's all, it's all you, the master on this bus controls the clocking. So whatever pace you're working at. Okay, so then you move, you move that flash memory to um, like a, uh, an adapter that emulates a floppy for your old white box PC or, or an ATA, a, uh, one that makes it look like an ATA hard drive or USB mass storage. Um, and, then, uh, and then you're home free. That's the high level. Okay, so uh, yeah, and you gotta, you got to do a bit of work if you're using the VIC-20 with basic interpreters, so that's going to be hell. Okay, so um, first tool you would need would be a hex editor, and you would, because basic is the only direct programming platform you're getting when you just turn this machine on and you're not bringing in external media, um, it is okay. If you had a hex editor uh, and it showed you some checksums, now, now you're in a situation where that hex that you generated from the assembly that you generated from the C on the computer you didn't trust, now you can actually just punch it in. It's going to take you a long time, but you're no longer relying on a computer telling you that this is what's actually on disk. You're, you're now punching it in. And so the thing you would want to punch in would then be another bootloader uh, that, uh, oh yeah, the, and then the, you'd have to write two programs in basic. The second one would be a bootloader that can load a program that you've put on tape with the, with the first program. So we're bootstrapping here, we're getting somewhere. Uh, and then again, relying on a computer you don't trust, you go through that same C to assembler to hex situation, probably to write a program for the VIC-20. And then this would be your one, you know, because you don't want to do this I2C stuff in basic, right? You're probably going to write it, run it right in C. So you would move it over that way. You would enter it in, in hex, uh, representing the MOS 6502 machine code, right, instead of having to figure out how to do the, your IC2 bit banging in basic, right? Okay, so, and again, you could rely on a PC that you don't trust to feed you using I2C the, um, the program you're hoping to load and transfer to flash memory, and uh, the program that you're running on the, the, uh, the VIC at this point can show you a bunch of checksums. It can say your, uh, uh, and so that way you don't have, the program that it's ultimately dem destined for your flash memory and destined for your PC, you don't have to type the whole thing in. You load it in and you, and you verify all the, uh, you just verify on screen, okay, this is right, this is right, this is right. Uh, and so then you, you're there. Uh, and, and this machine suggests a different approach. Someone at Skullspace has a hobby kit PDP-11. Now, um, and the really nifty thing about this one is, uh, it, uh, the base model has no firmware at all, but it's still bootstrappable. Now, in the, old, in, in the really, really olden days, if you wanted to bootstrap a computer that had no firmware, you, were, you had to use mechanical switches, and you had to put stuff in one at a time, and we don't want to do that. This HobbyKit PDP-11 with no firmware is kind of interesting because it's got microcode that can work with the serial port and let you put stuff in one memory address at a time. Um, and so again, you could hook that up to a PC you don't trust. You could have that PC over the serial line say, okay, we're putting this byte in this memory, this byte in this memory, this byte in this memory. Disconnect the PC, connect a glass teletype, uh, you know, a terminal, and go and inspect every memory address that you've put in this thing to, uh, to load to flash memory. Though I don't know if this has an interface like that. Uh, the other kind of old machine I'm thinking of that's self-programmable also are um, ones with open firmware. Uh, they, they have like a full fourth interpreter. So uh, as long as you have the hardware to do general purpose I.O., um, you should be able to use a platform like that, again, to write to some flash memory, put that in an adapter, put it in a PC, you know, now you're bootstrapped. All right, thank you everyone. I'm doing questions on the side, not in here. Uh, that'll be the B track. Enjoy the rest of the A track.